Our next speaker is a philosopher, game theorist, and social psychologist. Her research focus on judgment and decision-making makes taking a special interest in decisions about fairness, trust, and cooperation, and how expectations affect our behaviors. She also works to examine the evolution of social norms, especially norms of fairness and cooperation, while teaching at the University of Pennsylvania under joint appointments in philosophy, psychology, and the Wharton School. She's also the head of the Behavioral Ethics Lab and the director of the Master of Behavioral and Decision Sciences program as well. Today in our conversation, we're going to discuss the way messages about mask wearing have been received in nine different countries and the ways our belief systems influence how we hear those messages. And we hope that business leaders will pay attention to the fantastic results that Dr. Bicchieri will share with us. So please welcome Dr. Christina Bicchieri to Nudge It North. Thank you, happy to be here. And uh, I'm happy there is interest in this uh, new study we did uh, on nine countries really spread around the world. I will discuss that in a moment. But first, let's talk about the research question. So what, what did, you, did we want to understand? And uh, there is a lot of talk about norm nudging. Norman nudging means that you send messages about, uh, you know, uh, descriptive messages about how other people behave or injunctive normative messages, how other people, whether the other people approve or disapprove of certain behavior. And norm nudging basically either send one or the other messages or sometimes they combine both. And why do they do that? because the idea is uh, to change people's expectations about how other people behave or what other people approve of. And of course, uh, you have to pay a lot of attention when you send the message that these other people are a reference network for the people you are addressing, i.e. they are sufficiently similar, they are in a similar situation, and so on and so forth. And uh, of course, uh, with COVID-19, we need really to convince people to behave differently, okay? And think of wearing masks, social distancing, staying at home, and so on and so forth. And so sending these messages through the media, the government, etc., is extremely important, you know, to create new behavior, pro-socially important behavior. Now, our question has been, okay, this is a... a public health crisis, a public health situation. And in this case, uh, we not only send messages about, or want to send messages to induce people to behave uh, in a better way, in a pro-social way, if you will, but also these messages are accompanied by scientific messages, okay? So they are justified by what we know scientifically about, in our case, the virus. But if you think also in cases like global warming, we want people to change behavior. And again, it's very important that people trust the science, the scientific message behind it. And so what we ask in this case is, okay, suppose we do everything we can to convince people, you know, through norm nudging that uh, behavior is changing, that people similar to them in a similar situation, you know, are behaving in an appropriate way and really approve of this behavior. Will they change their behavior? Or if they don't trust science that much, there won't be that much change? This is the question that we ask. Now we did a survey, huge survey, in nine countries, okay, so with representative panels, China and uh, uh, South Korea in Asia. In Latin America, we have Colombia and Mexico. And in Europe, we have Northern and Southern European countries, UK and uh, Germany versus Spain and Italy. And then of course the US. And the U.S., as we well, see, is a very interesting example. 
<laughs> we are our own own piece. There we go. <laughs> Somewhat bothering. Okay. So what we do, we do two different things. We present each respondent with a vignette. In, and I show you the vignette in a social in a, in a moment, so I explain it next. Then we ask a report, self-reported self behavior. Okay, what you have done before the lockdown, after the lockdown, what were your expectations related to this behavior, and so on and so forth. And this is a very important robustness check because we want to see uh, whether what they respond in the vignette has in fact, uh, you know, uh, some, uh, some resonance is similar to what they self-report. And I can say now, yes, it does. Then we measure trust. And we measure trust, uh, various measures of trust, but the two most important here are trust in science and trust in government. Okay, very important to measure this. So, the vignette is important for norm nudging because with norm nudging, a, a presupposition, if you will, of norm nudging is that the behavior that you induce is really conditional on social expectations. Because if it's not, I can tell you everything I want about what other people do and approve or disapprove, you won't care, okay? So the important thing is, is behavior conditional on the expectation we have created? That's why we do vignettes. And uh, each respondent is presented, you know, with a randomly chosen one of four possible vignettes. And the vignette says the following, somebody like you lives in a very similar country that is affected by COVID. One possible vignette is most residents are practicing social distancing, staying at home, and most also believe that, that one should do that. Somebody else may receive a vignette, few residents practice and few residents basically approve, or most do few approve, or few do most approve. So there is two congruent and two incongruent behaviors, okay? And then we ask the responder, what do you think this person will do, given the information that he or she has? And this is very important because it tells me, you know, is that there is less of a demand effect because these people are talking about other people, other hypothetical people. And it tell me, tells me quite clearly whether for these people, a change in expectation would have an effect or not on behavior it is very important. Now, Look at the results of, okay, let me move here, of the social distancing uh, uh, predicted uh, with the, the vignette. And here I show you the clear cut cases when both expectation are high versus both expectation are low. And it's obvious. I mean, the, uh, I use social distancing here uh, I have two questions, one is social distancing, the other staying at home. They are super highly correlated, 98.9%. So it's, uh, I use only one for simplicity, but you can imagine the other is the same. And so basically what we see is that high expectation induce, okay, good behavior. When both are high, normative and empirical. And when both are low, you know, behavior goes down. And uh, this is the vignette result. And uh, I can tell you that also the self-report result is very similar. So people who report high level of expectation also report uh, high levels of good behavior, low expectation, bad behavior, okay? So there is a, a, a total symmetry between the vignette and the self-reporting, which is important because uh, we want a robustness check. We don't want that people say, oh, one thing in the vignette, but it's completely different in the self-report. Now, the, our question is, what is the mechanism, uh, you know, behind the connection between compliance and expectations, okay? And uh, are 
high expectation. It looks that if you have high expectation, Jesus, you will, you know, you will behave well. And so the policymaker looking at these results may think, okay, we are going to do norm nudging and create high expectation and people will behave in a positive way. Okay. Now, uh, what we thought is, uh, look, the interesting question here is not only that they can tell us that people have, uh, you know, that most people behave in an appropriate way and most people approve of it, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but the message behind everything is a science message, is a message about how serious COVID-19 is, is a message about how it is transmitted, and so on and so forth, and what we can do okay, to avoid getting sick. So we, we look at two particular uh, stories about trust. We ask about trust in your government, but also we ask trust in science. And we measure trust on a scale of one to four, and one, two is low, and three and four is high, okay? And um, uh, China, for example, this CH is China, is extremely high. Trust in government and trust in science are very high, the highest of all. And uh, in most cases, trust in science is usually higher than trust in government. You see that in most cases. However, if you look at the US, the last one, trust in science is quite low is not as high. Now, remember that these are averages, okay? And so on average, because people, when I, I show the results, ask me, what, America, the kingdom of science? Yes, <laughs> but, <laughs> okay? But not everybody is so much in line with scientific results. And so the US is interesting because it's a country that, uh, uh, that has um, a relatively low trust in science. But now let's look, this is very important, this kind of result. Here we only analyze people who have high expectations. So people who responded to the high expectation vignette. So they are told that this person in the vignette that they have to predict how this person will behave, this person is exposed to a large majority of people, okay, that practice social distancing and staying at home. Actually, they are very correlated, so I show only one. And, uh, and, uh, and then uh, we look uh, among these people, those that have high or low trust in science. And the orange colored is the low trust in science and the khaki color or whatever is high trust in science. And you see there is a huge difference. What does it tell me? The trust in science is a maximizer of compliance. For those people that say we have nudged to have high expectations, for those people that should be more likely to comply because they believe other people comply. And, uh, you know, we know that if they have these beliefs, it's more likely that they will comply. The problem is if they don't trust the message, these high compliance is highly moderated by that. And this is a very, very important thing to keep in mind. Now, is trusting government helping in any way? So to the left, we have people with low versus high trust in science, but low trust in government. And to the right, low and high trust in science, but high trust in government. And you see that the trust in government has no clear cut impact. So the most important thing is trust in science, which is very, very, very important. Then I will show you trusting government matter in one case. So 
Let's look, uh, here we have all the country that we have analyzed and we look at trust in government and trust in science. And we look at people with high expectations. Okay, again, it's very much like the previous, is the high expectation people, okay? And the high expectation people, what really matter, you look to the right, is trust in science. So if you have high expectation, trust in science matters a lot, okay? And low trust would be a big moderator. And trust in government, you see, goes all over doesn't matter, okay? So compliance is higher in all those countries where trust in science is high, provided they have high expectations, okay? Government role plays little role. Now, what happens with people who have low expectations? You know, with low expectation, you don't comply much. And what happens with low expectation is the compliance is higher in countries where trust in government is most high. Trust in science doesn't play a role. If you have low expectation, it doesn't matter that you trust science or not. Why? Because I think everybody is misbehaving. Who cares? Okay, but trust in government may help because uh, there are certain countries, uh, think of, uh, South Korea <laughs> or, uh, you know, um, basically China, of course, China <laughs> is low or high trust. They always comply, but you know, China is not a democratic country. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it has to be expected. But the interesting thing is when expectations are low, what matters is trust in government. Trust in science plays no role. When expectations are high, behavior is moderated by trust in science. Trust in science is very important. Now, somebody may ask me, uh, what happens with gender? Okay, is this a gender difference? Yes, there is. <laughs> uh, the orange are male and uh, the light are female. And female comply, uh, comply more in general. There is more compliance among women than men. Uh, this is self-reported compliance. It's very interesting because you look at the US, it's really low. <laughs> but even in the US, women comply more than men. <laughs> okay, and this is not an astounding result. Okay, uh, it, generally women are more compliant, follow more the rules uh, than men do. Now, education is interesting, it's very interesting. Now, as expected, the higher the education level, if you have high expectation, the higher compliance, okay? Higher education, higher compliance. Is, is not strange, is something I would expect. Also because probably there is a correlation between better education and trust in science. Okay, and so, you know, you have, uh, uh, you have this result. So more education with high expectation, more compliance. With low expectation, higher education actually is damaging. Look at European countries. People with college degree and low expectation comply less, okay? Uh, than their peers that are more ignorant, let's say. So it's very interesting if you have higher education and high expectation, sorry, here, you tend to comply more. But if you have low expectation, that is you believe that people are not complying and uh, don't, you know, disapprove of not complying, then people with higher level of education comply even less. This is very interesting, okay? And this happens in Europe, actually, both Southern and Northern Europe, okay? Which tells me that in these cases, and we have seen 
the results in Spain, Italy, UK, etc., cetera, uh, where, you know, whenever people start believing that there is low compliance, you know, uh, compliance goes down. And this goes even more down for people with uh, higher education. This is very interesting in those two areas. Christina, I don't mean to interrupt you here, but yeah. do you have a hypothesis about why that happens? And, and why is it very apparent in European and a little bit in Asian where it isn't seen as much in US and Latin America? Um, I, I really, it's very interesting. Uh, I can tell you uh, in Southern Europe, especially Italy, I know Italy very well, and I read what's happening, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, if people have uh, uh, low expectations, you know, they think, well, uh, everybody, you know, is um, everybody. Most people are not complying with the rules, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, if I comply, if I comply, there is a cost to compliance. Always remember that there is a cost. Okay, there is a cost to stay locked at home. And there is a cost to social distancing because you want to see your friends, your relatives, etc. And so, in that case, uh, what you feel is, uh, what the heck? Okay. Now we haven't crossed this, uh, and we should, uh, um, with trust in science. Okay. Uh, because the interesting thing is the following. Let's think of people who have high trust in science, okay? But they observe, they think that compliance is very low, okay? Then, you know, they may, you know, th there is a tension there between, oh my God, uh, you know, everybody's at risk. The perception of risk will be incredibly high and probably they will comply more. However, if you don't trust science, okay, there are two possibilities. Either you have high expectation, in which case you can behave opportunistically because, oh, almost all people are complying, but I don't trust these stories about COVID-19. So my risk is very low, I free ride. Versus I trust science, uh, sorry, I don't trust science, but, uh, you know, um, the, uh, you know, the risk is high as uh, in the case of low expectation. Well, in that case, uh, uh, you know, it's a mixed bag, basically. You don't trust science and uh, there, is, there are low expectation and then you are in this condition. I mean, you don't comply very much, okay, because is costly, few people are complying, and you think science is bogus. So it's interesting to look, we haven't looked yet at that, at how to combine this with the trust, with the low and high trust in science. But what I find interesting are these Southern Europe, Northern Europe results, okay, where the more uh, college, the more education you've had, the less we comply with low expectations, basically. We look sort of a, a, like a rational reaction, right? Now, income and compliance, this, uh, uh, this is interesting, but not tremendously. You see that uh, higher and middle income tend to comply more, okay? Uh, in the, this is self-reported in the US, of course, compliance is lower than in any other place. And we know that because we know, uh, uh, you know, the number of deaths and disease in the US. So we know that compliance is, is low. Latin America is very biased because we didn't count other Latin American countries. We counted only Colombia and Mexico. And if we had Brazil, probably the number would be very different, okay? But the US versus Europe, South and North Europe and Asia are interesting. And so what it tells me, 
that the lower the income, the lower um, is compliance. Okay, there is also a reason for that. Maybe very low income people have to continue working some way, and so the compliance will be lower. Okay. Now, this is very interesting. Trust in science and gender. <laughs> and again, we have male and female, and uh, women tend to trust science. They are more compliant and tend to trust science more. And in the US is very interesting because uh, we have, uh, you know, the lowest trust in science we've seen, but there is a huge difference between men and women. That's why I circle in red. Women in the US tend to trust science much more than their male counterpart. And I think it's interesting to ask why, okay? Why is it? Do women have better education? because people with better education tend to trust science more. You know, what is the difference? What is the root of this difference? And again, um, high trust in science and uh, education. Again, what we have is the more educated people, uh, you know, tend to trust science more. Obviously, this is college educated versus, uh, you know, high school or less. But I want to <laughs> underline again the US. Um, you know, in other countries, yes, there is a difference, sometimes bigger, uh, but not never as big as in the US. In the US, is really significant. So the college people have a much higher trust in science than people who are less educated. And this is very important very, very important uh, to keep in mind. And uh, that's it uh, about uh, the slides, okay? And uh, so what, what seem to happen here, if we look at gender, income, etc., is that women tend to be more compliant than men overall, and uh, women tend to trust science more. And uh, is it because uh, uh, women tend to be more educated than men? I don't know. I think women are just smarter than men uh, <laughs> I don't across the board. <laughs> I don't want to say that, but there is a huge, uh, a huge difference. And in the US in particular, there is uh, a, significant, uh, a significant difference. And uh, the question is why? And uh, we are, uh, we are uh, working on a paper on gender, trying to understand uh, all these uh, possible correlation and possible explanation for these results. But, uh, you know, this is it. Christina, I'm curious, the vignette that you served up doesn't have anything specifically scientific or governmental in, in the nature of it. There's nothing that alludes specifically to science or government. So oh, yes, is... Is there an unconscious process that's happening that is leading people to, uh, or is it just because we know we're all so familiar with one side or the other? We, we've already taken a position on whether we're going to wear masks or not, and, and, and finding out that, that there's high compliance in this fictional other country or low compliance, although it, that, that certainly does influence people, but is there some unconscious process that we're saying, oh, that this is a scientific thing, that for, for people who are low believers in science, that uh, that they're reading this and saying, oh, you know, this is this is just hogwash. This this whole this whole thing is just, you know, bogus. Uh, no, we cross this result uh, with the result about trust in science. Mm. Okay, it's very important to understand. The vignette, the, the goal of the vignette, is to, to decide whether behavior is conditional on expectations. Mm -hmm. So if I ask you, predict what this guy, John, in this uh, country very similar to yours, in a situation very similar, John is very similar to you, and John has this information, what do you think John will do, mm -hmm. okay? And, uh, you know, I ask uh, this question to thousands of people, of course, manipulating uh, the information sometimes, uh, a lot of people behave well, sometimes few people behave well, etc. So I want to be sure 
that uh, there is indeed an effect mm -hmm. of sending uh, this uh, differential information. So each person received just one vignette with one type of information. We have thousands and thousands of people who respond. And so we can say confidently that uh, um, inducing a certain expectation has an effect on behavior. Mm -hmm. So the preference for behavior is conditional on expectation. This is the goal of a vignette. But then, of course, you may, you may tell Christina, but yeah, people that respond to a vignette, you know, is a vignette after all, <laughs> you know, how do you say that it's not just a vignette effect and may not be robust? And so we do a robustness check. Mm. We check self-reported expectation and beliefs before and after the lockdown. And there is a very strong correlation. A very strong correlation. So this makes me feel better <laughs> about using the vignette. Then we ask question about trust. And then we see the people who have uh, responded to the vignette in particular, to the high expectations, say, oh, John will surely, <laughs> you know, comply, high compliance from John. But uh, when there is low trust in government, the belief uh, you know, on a scale of uh, zero to 10, okay, we have a scale, a sort of liquor scale of compliance. Compliance goes down for those that don't trust science. Yeah, which, which it brings so me to, to my next, brings me to my question, which is, it, it, you've shown, it, 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 it's very apparent that trust in, higher trust in science, people are more likely to uh, comply given the, the high expectations piece. And so that's a, that's a positive, right? We want more people to, to yeah. be doing these right behaviors. And you, you showed that there's a correlation between trust and science with, with gender, females, uh, you know, being a little bit more, and with education. Yes. But are there other, are there, and I don't know if you have any information on this, but how do we get people to have more trust in science? And what is the is there anything that we can do in order to do that? Or is that already preset and it's beyond our scope of being able to get people to trust more in science? No, uh, I mean, uh, education is crucial and scientific education is crucial. And it's interesting that the US uh, among all these countries is a country will, where scientific or education in general uh, is not uh, really, um, universalized in the following sense. In Europe, you study so much math, so much physics, so much chemistry, etc. let's say in high school. And uh, depending on the high school, you go to classics, scientific, uh, artistic, or whatever, you will study more or less. But science has to be studied. Mm. <laughs> okay, there is a, a sort of state designed program. Textbook may differ, you know, but still, you know, that is what you have to know. And this is the same uh, all over Europe, basically. There are no huge differences in uh, uh, what you learn. Okay. So in, uh, let's say you study biology and you study evolution yeah. and evolution studied everywhere. Okay. Now here in the US, there are huge differences. Okay and uh, uh, different states can have different policies about education and uh, different schools can have uh, uh, you know different uh, um, different ideas about what to teach for example in science or not uh, think of all the movement uh, anti-evolution okay and these uh, they teach this stuff they teach creationism in school. So uh, to me, there is a problem of uh, uh, deciding how much uniform education, scientific education should be. And in the US it's not uniform at all. And this may be the reason why we have all this problem about lack of trust in science, because we have great peaks, scientific peaks in the US. All the world sees that, but also we have bottoms. <laughs> 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 and that's why your average it goes down. You know, there are lots of dwarfs and few giants, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'd also like to, to say that 
it's really great to see that women outpace men significantly uh, in their acceptance. And yet, why aren't they doing a better job of convincing the men? <laughs> um, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea, really. Uh, this is beyond my, my comprehension. But certainly in response to your question, I think uh, education is the vehicle, is the way uh, to create uh, uh, you know, more trust in science. Also because trust in science is related to one thing that I think is very important, is tolerance for uncertainty. Mm. Okay? Yeah. When you study science, you start to learn that science changes and that what we have now are well-supported beliefs, okay? And these beliefs will change if you study history of science, okay? There is a, there is a, a progression, but still uh, there are scientific revolution, Kuhn studied them, but still, uh, you know, uh, we are facing uncertainty all the time, yeah. okay? And uh, I think uh, when you study science, you learn to tolerate uncertainty. Yeah. And you, a lot of people do not have this tolerance. They want certainty in their lives. And you said this was the way and you can't change it now. So therefore... Uh, ab absolutely. Yeah. And this is a big problem. And again, education should help becoming more tolerant about yeah. ambiguity, uncertainty, et cetera, and is not doing a good job here, I, I guess. <laughs> You've done a lot of work uh, on reference groups. And so I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm looking at this and going, all right, so when we think about reference groups, and, and as you said in the vignettes, it was lots of people do this, but your research shows that lots of people can do it, but if my reference group doesn't, that doesn't necessarily have as much um, yes. weight on, on those types of, of things. Yes. I'm, I'm wondering, uh, again, are, are reference groups different for women and men? Is that part of this issue? I mean, do women, uh, obvious, not obviously, do they, they have their reference groups more with other women and men with more with other men? Is that typically how it works? Or uh, no, lots no, of different exactly. components that we can't? <laughs> exactly. A reference group, uh, are, a reference group is basically uh, the people that um, I look at when I have to make a decision in a very specific situation. Okay. okay? So uh, reference group differ from situation to situation. And sometimes uh, we think, uh, oh, you know, uh, a reference group may be um, somebody who's specially close, like my neighbors. And sometimes it's true and sometimes it's completely false. Mm. Okay, That's why we do network analysis in our study, exactly to understand for the particular target behavior that we are analyzing who are the reference group. And sometimes uh, men and women may have different reference group. I give you an example. Uh, you know, exclusive in infant breastfeeding in sub-Saharan African countries for women, the reference group is the mother-in-laws. Mm. These are the people who matter to the decision. And, uh, you know, you have to, to do some work to understand that and then un understand how to intervene. In India, with open defecation, we, you would expect in a village the reference group is your neighbors, not necessarily is the family and sometimes member of the family who live far away. So this just tells you that you have to be very, very careful when you do a special intervention to be very clear about who the reference group is and work on that. Which makes a big difference in norm nudging around some of these COVID behaviors. Who is the reference group that you're looking at? And you, you look at particularly in the U.S. at this point, there are very different reference groups in political ideology and a variety of other factors that probably are impacting a lot of this. Uh, I think, uh, I think uh, is a very good question. Uh, there are, first of all, when you send a message, a norm nudging message, you have to be very careful to whom are you sending it. If I send it to young people, you know, uh, I will have to to find some message that really resonates with them, 
that resonates with the reference group, older people is a different story. So you send different messages. Or what you say is sort of more uh, significant and probably bothering is the polarization we are in. We live in very polarized times. And so, you know, uh, just, uh, uh, you know, telling you other workers, okay, are doing X, Y, Z may not mean much, okay, if uh, I am, let's say, an evangelical worker, <laughs> mm -hmm. okay? So it's very, very important uh, to be completely aware of uh, the area where you're sending the message and the type of people you're sending the message to. And uh, clearly, um, you know, in a very polarized situation, but in any situation, I would say people will look at people who are similar to them. What mm. do they do, these people who are similar to me? Mm. Because I may imitate them. I may take into account what they do. But if you are not similar to me, I don't care. Yeah. Okay. And we have to take into account also polarization when we send these messages, of course. And, That's and very important. And as you said, the, the groups, uh, we have different reference networks for different reasons and, and we'll have, yes. right? so, so I might look at you as being very similar uh, because of education in one scenario, but if it's a gender issue, I might yes. be looking at you differently. And if it's a political issue, you and I might be aligned or might be different. Is, is that about right? Absolutely. Uh, you know, this is studied, was studied forever in social psychology, uh, you know, group identification, basically, uh, you know, in different situations, you may identify with different groups. If you focus me on my Italian identity, <laughs> I will act and uh, maybe speak or say things that are more in line with that identity. My academic identity is a different story. My woman identity, my mother identity are all very different uh, uh, group social identity that uh, I wear, if you will, uh, in different situations. So this story about the reference group also has to do very much with the groups we identify with in specific situation. And again, we have to pay attention to that. Christina, thank you. This has been fantastic, uh, really insightful. And I think there's a lot of value that people are gonna be able to take out of this, uh, but still lots of questions, right? There's a lot of more questions that, that it raises, which is what science does. It, it, it answers some questions, but raises a lot more. And I exactly. think it's one of the, exactly. the wonderful pieces of, of science and, and how this is. So thank you so much for, for being part of Nudge It North. And we appreciate you taking the time to tape this and so we can share it with, with all the participants. Thank you so much. Thank you to you. You do a great job. <laughs> okay. And have a nice rest of the day. <laughs>